Welcome to The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis. I am your host, Cicely Davis. Welcome back, American Savages, to The Savage Truth. Cicely here. Thank you for joining me today. Ecstatic as always to be with you and spend a little time. If you're new here, welcome. Plan on having a good time. We have a good time here. We keep it exciting, always making it fun. For those of you returning, welcome back and thank you for taking the time once again to lend an ear as always. I ask what? That you please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And I don't mean to speed through that. Seriously, folks, please leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. It really does help us out. It keeps the show growing um, and the participation up really helps us out on this side. And we are so very appreciative of that. For those of you who don't know, okay, I live in Minneapolis. Yes, Minneapolis, Minnesota. But I'm not originally a Minnesotan. I'm actually originally from the great state of New York. I'm going to go call my father. See, it's right there under the surface. I can pull it out when I need to. Okay. But um, actually, I'm originally from the state of New York, upstate New York, Rochester. Now, you will hear New Yorkers say that upstate New York is not actually New York. I am biased. I, of course, disagree with that. But New York was the focus and showed itself as MAGA hungry, okay, when Donald Trump showed up to rally in the boogie down Bronx, okay? This is a borough that voted 90%, 90% for Biden in 2020 were chanting for Trump, 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 four more years, Four more years. I mean, this was amazing. They were shouting, I love you, all this stuff. I mean, he got much love out of the boogie down, okay? They were decked, decked out, okay? What we like to say, suited and booted, okay? Let me give you a little Ebonics um, education here today, but they were suited and booted, but they were decked out in Trump and MAGA hats. They were waving MAGA flags. They were wearing Trump and MAGA T-shirts, and waited and camped in the rain to see and hear him speak. This is a major, major, major score for Trump. And it's a great indication for our republic. Countless, countless New Yorkers, New Yorkers, from all walks of life, everyone, okay? All walks of life, educational background, social economic status, rallying together to cheer on their next presidential hopeful. And I'm so proud, so very proud right now as I sit in the seat and I talk about this to be a New Yorker, really proud of that. ALC was embarrassed, okay? She was running her mouth and got hurt, humiliated, embarrassed, annoyed, so very obviously annoyed that so many of her constituents had turned out over a new, they really basically what they did is They turned over a new red leaf in the midst of her very, very blue district. She implied, if you watch the interviews, that Trump flew in, flew people into the Bronx, that these weren't real people from the borough itself. They weren't real Bronx people. They weren't truly people from the 14th district um, that. And the reason why that he did that was because Trump is broke and needs to fly people in for the optics and to pay for his legal fees. I mean, this is a joke. This is so laughable. And I challenge you, everyone watching and listening right now to me, go to the Internet. Okay, go to any outlet, go anywhere. And mind you, CNN and MSNBC, they were almost vomiting and they had to admit that the turnout in the Bronx, because they were led by AOC, was better um, than they expected. But go to any Internet and pick any outlet any media outlet and view the footage and listen to the folks interviewed. And you tell me if you get a sense that these weren't true people from the Bronx, true Bronx natives, true boogie down natives. They are fed up. Okay. Fed up with the Biden lie machine. They're fed up with the fraud and the lawfare and the weight of inflation, right? Taking money out of their wallets, taking money away from their children and their future, You know, they can't afford gas and groceries. They're tired of this immigrant takeover, this lawlessness. You go and you listen and you tell me. AOC was noticeably upset because Trump currently draws 
larger crowds in her borough than she does. And I personally take personal satisfaction in knowing that. She claims that the Bronx is blue, that Brooklyn is blue and Queens is blue, and that very well may be. But those blue folks were loud and proud on the media saying, hey, some people even actually said, hey, I am a Democrat, but I'm voting for Trump. Looks like someone spilled some red in this greater city of New York because I see red popping out everywhere. But this is a strong indication, folks, of how people are leaning. It suggests to me, like we've been saying on this show, telling the savage truth that left to their own devices, people will vote according to their kitchen table, okay? Those issues that they care about, those issues that actually touch them on a daily basis. I am by no means su suggesting that all of New York City is red. I'm, I'm, I'd be stupid enough to do that. And you're not stupid. You understand that that's not true. But Trump has a chance in New York City, and that hasn't been a focus for Republicans for quite some time. As a matter of fact, New York has been a primarily blue state ever since the Great Depression, only siding with the losing Republican when it chose its then current governor, Thomas E. Dewey, over Harry S. Truman in 1948. Now, we know that to be have changed in 19, that was 1948. We'll flip that 4-8 to an 8-4 when New York actually voted for Ronald Reagan. It has voted Democratic in the last nine elections, six of those by 20 percent margin. President Reagan won, of course, New York in 1984. So I'm no political fool, okay? But I see purple. I see a little magenta, okay? That blue is getting some red mixed in it, okay? We're throwing some red in that blue soup, and it looks darn tantalizing to me. And that's a real threat to the Democratic Party. They need to get themselves together, okay? And I don't think that they can pull it out of the hat truly in enough times. Those people were serious about the issues and the suffrage under Joe and Kamala. They were clear that Biden has done N-O-T-H-I-N-G for them in the last four years to improve their way of life. They have less money in their pockets. They can afford less gas and less groceries. They're maxed out on their credit cards. Young kids need more and more roommates to be able to afford it, um, to live in an apartment or to even buy a home. That's not even within their scope. Right. They made that clear that this will not be the typical come around every four years, feed us some garbage, tell us we're victims of the Republican Party, victims of a racist American white history, whitewashed history, victims of a white bias system that hates the underserved. We want to know what you will do, what you and Kamala will do for us in the next four years. They're not going for the okie doke, like I said in the last episode. I'm going to keep using that term. They're not going for it. The Biden administration admit that that's what they need to do. They need the Biden administration. They want to hear the Biden administration admit that they lied to the people and that they failed, period. Nothing else will suffice. This is so great to see. So great to see. It's just great to see people come alive and really go out there and support Trump for the right reasons, for the exact right reasons, because Americans are coming together and they want a president who actually cares about them and their issues, cares about their future, cares about the future of America and will actually put them in America first. So I have this front row seat. I'm watching all of this and I'm enjoying the view and love the show so far. I'm loving it. So let's keep watching. OK. And I, before I pass on to the next um, subject matter, this is really important because what do I talk about all the time? I talk about contrasts and comparisons. Listen to this. I want you to just really hear the words of the two presidents so you understand what you the energy and the thought that you need to take to the voting polls come November. Here's a tale of two presidents. Contrast and comparison, folks. Listen to this. This is Joe Biden's words, okay? What is democracy if a trail of broken promises still leave black, black communities behind? What is democracy if you have to be 10 times better than anyone else to get a fair shot? And most of all, 
What does it mean as we're have we heard before to be a black man who loves his country, even if it doesn't love him back in equal measure? But let's be clear what happens to you and your family when old ghosts and new garments seize power. Extremists come from the freedom. They don't see you in the future. OK, those are Joe Biden's words. Here's in comparison to that. You have Donald Trump. OK, and in my in my opinion, Joe Biden is speaking at people, not actually to them. Here's in contrast, Donald Trump's words. It doesn't matter whether you're black or brown or white or whatever the hell color you are. It doesn't matter. We are all Americans and we're going to pull together as Americans. We all want better opportunity. And I'm not and I'm not just going to promise it. I'm going to deliver it now. If you don't take any other issues with you, if you can't be mindful of anything else, if this political stuff is too much of an overload for you, I suggest you remember those words. OK, take that to the polls come November. I guarantee you it will have you looking like the boogie down Bronx and you will be voting the right way. OK, if you're a Democrat woman listening in, I want you to know moving on to the next story. I want you to know that Hillary Clinton says you, <laughs> you are the blame for her presidential loss in 2016. <laughs> so now, according to Mrs. Clinton, there is a new set of, there's a new set of feet at which she needs to lay blame. Yes, former Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton blamed women for her 2016 loss and suggested they couldn't vote for her because she was supposed to be perfect. Here's your quote. You got to hear this. This is amazing. We got to get some footage on this stuff. It's so amazing to actually hear them saying it. Here's what she said. They left me because they just couldn't take a risk on me because as a woman, I'm supposed to be perfect. They were willing to take a risk on Trump who had a long list of let's call them flaws to illustrate his imperfection because he was a man and they could envision a man as a president and commander in chief. Now, this is as reported out of the New York Times. So she was interviewing with the New York Times while discussing her new book, The Fall of the Row, The Rise of a New American, and sounded the alarm of what she believed a second Trump administration would look like. Now, she told the New York Times that her warnings about abortion were ignored by a lot of the country. She said this, and I quote, too many women, particularly too many young women who did not understand the effort that went into creating the underlying theory of Roe v. Wade. And the young women on my campaign made a very compelling argument that making it safe and legal was really the goal, she said. I kind of just pocketed the framework of Roe. She also discussed and accused Democrats of being too complacent and underestimating the strength of the pro-life movement. And she said this, we, we didn't take it seriously and we didn't understand the threat. Most Democrats, most Americans did not realize we are in an existential struggle for the future of this country. And truly, folks, this is the kicker for me. She said that. The right, us, on the right side. The right is relentless. You know, they take a loss, they get back up, they regroup, and they raise more money. It's tremendously impressive the way that they operate. And we have nothing like it on our side. Oh, that made me feel so good to hear that, right? This is how they see us. So we have to recognize who we are and our power. Um, and I just really love that sentiment. And she's absolutely right. When you get down to the bare bones of Americans, people who actually believe in law and order, they have a, a ground and faith, faith. They believe in the exceptionalism of this country, right? They believe in right and wrong. They take a hit as our forefathers did, right? The people who actually constructed and laid the foundation for our country, this nation as we know it. You take a hit, right? You, you dust it off, you put a little alcohol on the wound, put a Band-Aid on, you get back up and you keep on going. That's what we do. This is the sentiment that I take away from this entire commentary from this communist socialist hack, which is what she is, that we are winning. 
right? That we are winning and that we can win. You have to believe that. You have to know that. She gave us insight on how she sees us, how the Democrat Party sees us. And that is what we have to do. Keep going. Be savage, absolutely savage in our pursuits to get our country back and not give up any more ground. Keep what we have and guard it. Get back what we lost. And once we get it, never, ever, ever give it up again. Okay, this is a praise moment for me. It's a praise moment for you. It's a praise moment for us because I give no homage to anything at all what Hillary Clinton has to say otherwise. She's clearly still, (laughs) she is still sore about her 2016 loss and apparently will never, ever get over it. And that's simply because, folks, she recognizes truly in her heart of hearts, as everyone knows, both on the Republican and the Democrat side, independents and everyone else in between, however they politically identify that Hillary Clinton's position as far as her political future, it's over. It's done. She has no place. So I just say, you know what? She needs to get over it. She at least needs to quit referring to it. She's a sore loser. She just got to let it go. But this is how she sees us, folks. That's a that's a cheerful moment for us. Now, moving on. Oh, 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 oh. This is a hot one, folks. Have you heard? Fannie Willis is having more trouble. Go figure. Apparently, an ex-staffer testified that she was fired after blowing the whistle on the DA's spending. Yes, more of her spending troubles. Fannie Willis says she won't voluntarily testify. She wouldn't. This was all last Thursday. She said she wouldn't voluntarily um, testify, calling the committee, of course, unlawful. So a fourth... Georgia State Senate Investigation Committee hearing as part of its probe into alleged misconduct by District Attorney Fannie Willis concluded last Thursday afternoon. The Senate Special Committee on Investigations chaired by Republican State Senator Bill Cosert, I believe, I think it's Cosert is how that's pronounced, considered sworn testimony from witness Amanda Timpson, who served as Willis's director of juvenile diversion programs, but says she was demoted and eventually fired. Cosert says her termination was after she became a whistleblower and complained about the misuse of funds. This is by far one of the most messy... (laughs) One of the messiest counties in this country, Fulton County. What the heck goes on in Fulton County? Someone's got to get down there and help them out. This is an atrocity, I swear. I, I, I can't believe that she actually was just nominated to run again as DA, but go figure. What's going on in Fulton County, Georgia? Um, Timpson testified that she was subject to overwhelming retaliation and pushback after notifying her direct boss that Willis's office was knowingly misusing federal grant funds, which, of course, is illegal. So this is the meat of the case. Timpson helped to write and apply for a competitive federal grant focused on programming to help at-risk youth and grant prevention. And she testified that when Willis took office in 2021, her new supervisor, Michael Kufi, told her that He planned to use the funds to purchase computers and travel and swag as part of the office's rebranding upon Willis's administration. Now, when Tipson told her boss that those purchases were not permitted under the grant, he persisted in his plans for those purchases. He told Tipson that Willis required all her staff to refer to her as Madam and that the swag and the other purchases were Willis's vision, um, as testified by Tipson. Tipson said that um, after serving in the previous district attorney's administration, she was required to interview again, which, you know, isn't altogether that irregular, just to keep her job in December of 2020. Nathan Wade, who roughly a year later would be hired as a special prosecutor, was on Tipson's interview panel, along with Willis and her communications official, Jeff DeSantis, not to be confused with Ron DeSantis of Florida. Okay, 
<laughs> now, remember, folks, Nathan Wade's phone records showed he made midnight trips to Fannie Willis's condo before he was hired. Now, that has nothing to do with the case, but I'd like to just keep you mindful of the players here of who we're referring to. Tipson said she wanted Willis to be aware of the misuse of funds to protect her and protect the integrity of the grants. She said that after Willis was made aware of Tipson's warnings, she was demoted to the position of file clerk. So essentially, she said that after she made it clear um, that, hey, these funds are being misused, this will not protect your in integrity, these are the grant money is being misused, Miss Willis, you got to be aware of this, your guy is not doing the right things with these funds. She said that she was demoted to file clerk. Tipson testified that after she escalated her claims of retaliation to the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights Compliance, she was eventually terminated and escorted out of the building by seven armed investigators. Seven men took one woman out. <laughs> Fulton County, Georgia, folks. Tipson also testified that Willis made completely slanderous and libelous statements about her employment history, which made it difficult for, difficult for her to secure future employment. And she said this, I thought that I was going to be, I thought that I was going to ultimately retire from the DA's office and it made a place that I used to be proud of working. It made it a hell for me, essentially. It made my life extremely hard and my family's life extremely hard. And just, you know, for me, it's, I'm here today to fight for my reputation, to fight for the youth of Fulton County, but also for the truth. For the truth. Well, Ms. Tipson, I am sorry to tell you, as you have already discovered, Fanny Willis is not interested in the truth, the savage truth as being told. She's not interested. She's made the comment that no one is above the law when she won that Democratic endorsement reelection about 10 days ago, two weeks ago. She made that comment, no one's above the law. But what she's actually saying is that she herself is above the law and then no one else is. Hence her unwillingness to, to, to testify. The whole country, the whole country, by way of the Democrat regime, has Americans fed up. And they're waking up. And the forgotten men and women of this country, the normal people, the normies, I like to call, the blue-collar Democrats who've been slighted for decades, are all coming together as part of a growing movement from the ground up, okay? And so when I think about, and I refer back to those people that gathered in the boogie down, right? I'm talking about the normies, right? Like I said, there were plenty of Republicans there who were already Donald Trump supporters, but what I'm talking about are construction workers, people who drive trucks, people who deliver food, electricians, OK, people who get up and have to ride the train every day. Right. Working people, teachers, educators. Right. People who work in um, warehouses. Those are the um, that's the American people. Right. That movement extends from the heartland to the street corners. It's everywhere. And the Bronx, it's in Harlem, it's in New Jersey, where we've seen these amazing, massive rallies for Donald Trump. It's just the beginning. Donald Trump is campaigning on Biden's side of the field and he will be doing the same thing in other cities. I guarantee it. Just like AOC said it wouldn't happen in the Bronx, we will see it happen in Philly, in Detroit, in Milwaukee, in Atlanta. Yes, out of Fulton County, even in Las Vegas. You see, we are fundamentally changing the political coalition in America by upholding its exceptional republic and telling the savage truth. And for that, I say, please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And if you want to be a part of that coalition and return the power to the people, actually save democracy, then all you have to do is be bold, be strong, be faithful, be true. Till next time, I'm Cicely. The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis is a production of Front Page Magazine and the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.